Hello, Buddhist geeks. This is Vincent Horn doing my customary opening, and I'm joined today by our friend David Chapman. Um, but don't let the term friend fool you. That doesn't mean we're not going to have some disagreements, as David is uh, want to point out. So we'll be here in a lively discussion today. And David, can you hear me? Uh, you just dropped out, but you're back now. Okay, great. Well, good to have you on the show. It's awesome. It's awesome to to be here speaking with you. Thank you. It's great to be here um, with you and with the Buddhist geeks. Yeah, good to have you back. Um, so, just a, a little brief intro for uh, for those who those folks who don't know you yet. Um, you are a writer. You've been blogging on several uh, blogs for a few years now. Uh, one of my favorites is called Meaningness. And it's you can find it at meaningness.wordpress.com. You also have a cool blog on Buddhism for vampires, and uh, you write about all kinds of things related to uh, contemporary culture, technology, uh, tantric Buddhism, um, all sorts of interesting things, philosophy. Um, so it's great to have you, uh, you know, kind of exploring some of those things with us today. Um, we also um, spoke to you. Um, I forget how long ago it was, but probably a year or so ago, at least. Um, Hokai Sobel. Uh, did a sort of guest interview with you talking about consensus Buddhism and mindful mayo. Um, and uh, for, for anyone who's interested, I think that's a good introduction in some ways to the conversation that we're going to have today, which is on reinventing Buddhist Tantra. So this is a fascinating topic. Um, you've been writing about it recently on your blog on meaningness.wordpress.com. Uh, and um, I was curious if we could just start, because this is a long series that you've been working on. And apparently, uh, according, to the, according to the series itself, um, there's still much yet to be written. Um, so I was wondering you know, what kind of the overarching purpose or, or intention with that series is, and if you could just share a bit about the background there. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think... Buddhism potentially can address some major problems in contemporary modern Western culture and society. Um, and I also think it could very easily go effectively extinct or become entirely irrelevant in decades. And in that case, that potential would be lost. Uh, the kinds of Buddhism we have now are, for various reasons, um, probably not equipped to handle the issues that I have in mind. Um, the, the traditional ones are uh, archaic and culture-bound, so they're not really accessible for most people. And um, modern Buddhism is, is already, I think, in a way obsolete. It developed first, this is something I've learned about recently that I think not a lot of people know, it developed in uh, in Asia first, modern Buddhism did, to address political problems that uh, Thailand, Japan had in the 1800s. And then that version was adapted to by Westerners to address Western cultural problems of the mid-20th, late 20th century. Uh, the problems we have now are, are different, I think. Um, and so we need a different kind of Buddhism. Mm. And in the process of modernization, some key parts of traditional Buddhism got dropped out, which I think I would like to recover. Mm. Uh, in particular, um, Tantric Buddhism has tools that um, can address uh, current spiritual problems, um, pr thinking particularly about the atomization of meaningness, the atomization of culture, of society, um, of ourselves as a result of that. If you just look at your Twitter stream, there, there's this explosion of stuff and how do we deal with that? How do we navigate this heaving sea of meaning? Hmm. Um, this is not something that I think Buddhism has tools within it that could address that, but they're not available now. So I'd like to bring those tools to bear on contemporary culture. And um, you know, Tantra is, is all about communication and about enthusiasm. And uh, it's something I'm enthusiastic about, so I'm trying to communicate my enthusiasm. 
Mm, great, great. And, you know, I, I think the place to start, especially for those of us who may not have a really deep grasp of what Tantra is, um, might be with this um, notion that you present, which is that the method of Tantra is unclogging energy by uniting spaciousness and passion. And it seems like one of the ways that you're claiming Tantra is sort of unique to other forms of Buddhism, um, in particular some of those that have been modernized to, to a large degree, you could say already, and, and have also become even mainstream, you know, with the whole mindfulness movement as a great example of that in the, uh, with the Theravada Buddhist tradition. So, um, you know, I wanted to see if you could say a little bit about what this uh, kind of core notion you have of Tantra is um, around spacious passion, because that's that's a kind of unique term that I, I had myself hadn't run across before. Yeah, um, I think of this as a sort of a secret formula. This is the, um, the one sentence summary of, of Buddhist Tantra, which is, uh, it's an attitude of um, uniting spaciousness and passion to unclog energy, which aims for mastery, power, nobility, and playfulness. Mm. Um, some of those words may be familiar from other kinds of Buddhism, although they're, they're the, 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 the slant's a little different. Some other one of those words you might not think of as being particularly Buddhist at all. Um, so maybe I can unpack it like a, playfulness, word by word base. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, or you know, nobility, even energy, is something that is a central theme in tantra. You don't hear a lot about elsewhere. Hmm. Um, so, first of all, I see the essence as an attitude, um, which means not simply a mental state, but actually, you can say an attitude is like a posture or a disposition to act in a particular way. Um, so we're already, with that word, crossing the inside-outside boundary. Um, Tantra takes for granted that that's basically imaginary or permeable. And um, an attitude is always an attitude towards something uh, that's outside of you. And uh, one of the supposedly distinctive features of Tantra is that it values the, the everyday world positively and it's always about what's happening in the everyday world. It's not uh, concerned with escaping from reality into some kind of um, immaterial nirvana. Um, so the next word is freedom from fixed meaning. Mm. Um, letting go of the compulsion to categorize, to give values to things, interpret them, and that can liberate you from automatic responses. This is not so different from emptiness as it's understood in mainstream Buddhism, um, or wisdom is sort of the, 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 the experience or recognition of emptiness. There's a slightly different twist here, but it's basically the same concept. Uh, so we've got spacious passion. Passion is um, a strong emotion. And a, a tantra is distinctive in saying that emotion, all emotions are okay. There's no bad emotions. And uh, you shouldn't be trying to get rid of emotions or to fix them or uh, anything like that. Um, Passion is what connects us with the world. It's what drives our action, and this is what this form of Buddhism is is about: is is acting in the everyday world. Um, the um, passion drives a connection, which um, is. Uh, created, maintained, and ended by effective and accurate activity. Um, connection involves appreciation, communication, interaction, involvement, and intervention. 
I've lost your video. Are you still there? Yeah, I've just turned it off because I was losing you a bit. Great. Okay, so continue. Um, so we're uniting passion and spaciousness. Uh, passion is something that we've got everywhere in the everyday world. Um, mainstream Buddhism sees that as a problem. Its antidote is uh, heading towards some kind of um, sense of an Atman or emptiness in which that disappears. Um, that's very valid. The recognition of, of that emptiness or selflessness is, is critical. It's the base for Tantra. But we want to then bring that experience together with passion um, in order to uh, transform emotions by experiencing their empty nature. Um, and when passion is experienced as empty or placed in the envelope of spaciousness, then it clarifies, the different emotions clarify into different wisdoms. Um, and this um, allows the energy of the passion to flow freely in directions that are revealed by the spaciousness. Okay, great. Um, can, can I go back to one thing you said and just kind of uh, uh, explore this with you? So you, you mentioned that modern Buddhism in some ways is uh, a, opposed to this passion or wanting to kind of negate this passion or transcend this passion. Um, now this is a point you and I have gone a little bit back and forth on. And, and in my experience, um, that's true in some cases, but definitely not in all cases and, and maybe not even in most cases, um, at least yes. the folks that I've talked to. So I wanted to kind of explore this a bit more. What, what is it all modern Buddhism, or is it certain people? You know, and and what is the what's going on there? Yeah, uh, this is a really interesting and uh, subtle question. I think it's certainly true that um, what I've said so far um, is uh, distinct from traditional Buddhism, but many modernists. Um, value emotions positively and uh, so there's a development in modern Buddhism particularly to incorporate Western psychological ideas to address that and um, that's done to varying degrees uh, and um, the um, most um, I, th I think We've talked about this in terms of the uh, East Coast versus West Coast split in the Vipassana movement, which yeah. our friend Anne Gleig has written a very interesting paper about. And she argues that the West Coast Vipassana movement is quasi-tantric. And I, I think that's right. Um, I think uh, she's got a really good point there that um, Jack Cornfield and the other teachers there have brought in... Um, some ideas from Tantra and you know, possibly even some practices. I don't know because I, I don't know their work very well. Yeah. Um, so where the, the distinction lies is in that um, there's still a kind of a waffling there as far as I can tell, that there's still some uh, renunciate elements yes. in, in even the most... Uh, tantric, one could say, of the mainstream modernist Buddhisms. And there's a, a big reluctance to incorporate the practices and some of the doctrines of Tantra which um, work with passion. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I think this is where it's so interesting to cross-train um, across different kind of approaches because it, it, it becomes much easier to see the differences and I, I have no experience with Tantra so um, but what you're describing does sound distinct in some ways from the from the sort of West Coast Vipassana um, but but you know one last thing just on that because I, I think this was a kind of interesting point that I that I heard Jack 
uh, Cornfield make a few years ago on retreat. Someone was asking him about this sort of this very thing, and um, they were asking him if you know bas basically some question about whether Vajrayana was superior to Hinayana. You know, they're bringing in all these kind of Tibetan terms, and uh, you know his response, which was quite interesting, had something to do or something along the lines of saying, you know, basically you find these different um, kind of attitudes or these different ways of approaching experience um, across different traditions. You know, you find Vajrayana in the Theravada tradition. You find, you know, you find that every the world is sacred attitude, you know, uh, mm -hmm. deep, deeply embedded in certain approaches or teachers. You also find, you know, um, I, I'd, I'd say you, maybe you, you'd have more experience of this, but you find a, you know, more Hinayana renunciative uh, attitude and plenty of uh, probably Tibetan and Vajrayana teachers. Maybe even some Tantric teachers might be more on that side. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I thought that was a kind of interesting point to kind of disconnect the approach or the attitude from the historical, traditional vehicle. Um, and I found that quite, it made a lot of sense uh, of the different kinds of orientations that various people I've met have, have taken to these things, even if they're coming at the same exact tradition. Yes. Um, I, I would say uh, that the, the attitude is the essence of the vehicle, um, if vehicle is understood as yana. Yeah. Uh, something that's often misunderstood is, is to think that Tibetan Buddhism equals Vajrayana, which essentially means Buddhist Tantra. Right. And in fact, Tibetan Buddhism is mostly not Tantric. It's mostly uh, Hinayana and Mahayana and renunciate in its orientation. Mm. And at the same time, something I only ex started exploring quite recently is that um, Theravada act very strong tantric tradition that is still live and current in Asia in um, all of the Theravada countries except Sri Lanka um, actually have uh, a, a tantric Buddhism and um, there's there's some sketchy reason for believing that the East Coast West Coast split on uh, renunciate versus tantric may actually be connected with uh, different approaches in Burma versus um, uh, Thailand, yeah. where the, the Thai approach really incorporates some tantric elements with their renunciate practice, where in Burma those are kept quite separate. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, cool. Thanks for going down that rabbit hole with me, because it's uh, something I've definitely wanted to talk to you about. Um, so, so kind of going back to reinventing um, Buddhist Tantra, um, you mm -hmm. sort of described what you see as kind of the, the core attitude of Tantra, this um, uh, bringing together of spacious passion. And mm -hmm. um, I wondered then if we could extrapolate out to what a Western Tantra, or maybe maybe at this point I don't. Need, sometimes I don't even like the term Western. It's like what what a global Tantra might look like. Yes, modern or modern or contemporary. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I think clearly, more or less by definition, a modern Buddhist Tantra should combine the best of the Western heritage. Um, our uh, Western values, culture, and understanding with compatible Buddhist elements, in particular tantric ones. Um, what that's going to look like, uh, people will have different ideas, obviously, because people have different values. The West is not at all... Um, people find different parts of Western culture positive or negative, uh, so um, I don't think there's any one right answer. I ideally would like to see the development of many different modern Buddhist tantras that would uh, address different people who have different ideas about what it ought to be. Yes. Uh, personally, I would. Uh, I have a education as a scientist and an engineer, and that means uh, I would like to see. Um, a, a version of, of Buddhist Tantra that is compatible with the a lot of the values of the European Enlightenment. Um, 
so it might be secular uh, in the sense of um, non-dogmatic and teaching attitudes and practices rather than things you're supposed to believe. Um, I'd like to see it science compatible, uh, rational, empirical. Uh, I think it um, could be entirely without supernatural concepts. Sometimes people think of Buddhist Tantra as kind of the magical branch of of Buddhism, and I think that's sure. a misunderstanding. Um, there's nothing in it that's inherently about about magic or gods or demons or any of those things, even though um, as it has been presented, those are central. Um, I think uh, it. I would like to see um, modern Buddhism uh, take Western philosophy and psychology seriously, and I think Tantra has something to offer philosophically. Mm. Um, I would also like to see, um, maybe more importantly, um, Tantra engaged with uh, artistic culture. Um, it can teach creativity that's really quite central to Tantra, and it would ideally be in dialogue with uh, Western music, art, fiction, you know, even video game design, say. This is, you know, there's, there's, there's opportunities there. Mm. Um, tantra, wonderment or awe is a, is a big theme in Tantra and, and also in art. So these are, um, go very nicely together and, and artistic creativity has always been a, a, a big aspect of Tantra. Um, in terms of what a modern Tantra should be, something uh, that's an interesting um, feature is that it says uh, women are inherently better practitioners than men, and um, men ought to relate to women, uh, you're taking that into account, which is kind of not the way things have gone in Tantra in recent centuries, but that's something that we could recover. Um, there's some inspiring female role models in tantric history, uh, and there's teachings on how men and women can relate to each other, which might be relevant. Uh, you know, modern Buddhism takes it for granted that men and women are equal, but the, the tradition that it's based on is systematically misogynistic, and tantra, at least in theory, is not. Um, Relatedly, Tantra acknowledges that romantic love and sex are hugely spiritually important to us um, and values them positively where the whole mainstream tradition sees them as hindrances and um, you know the number one thing you need to give up. So um, again, this is the modern Western view, but uh, there's not a lot of uh, religious teaching from any tradition available on how this might work, and so Tantra may again have something to offer there. Um, Tantra is inherently relational in a much broader sense. Um, it's about communication, collaboration, uh, so it's um, inherently a group activity, and it's inherently um, about social um, uh, organization, well, uh, social um, factors. So uh, this is um, uh, can imply an engagement with social problems that we have now. Um, Okay, great. So, so sounds like there's a lot there's a lot of ways in which uh, tantra might have a unique kind of contribution to some to some of the things in the West that that have already been important for a long time. And and did did I cut yeah, you off? Because because if there's something you you're you're about to say, feel free to add it. Uh, no, let's um, by all means. Okay, so it sounds like. I, just as you started speaking, that the creative uh, aspect came to mind and. 
I was glad to hear you touch on that because that seems like an obvious area where there's a there's a kind of connection. Um, I was imagining, you know, if Vipassana really appealed to these sort of scientists and geeky types, you know, um, that Tantra would kind of natu more naturally appeal to creative types. Um, and I know that's an oversimplification, but it makes a lot of sense based on how you're describing it earlier. Yes, uh, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I'm a geeky type, but I have some artistic uh, inclinations um, also. Uh, I, it is... Um, it, it's, it's a very beautiful system uh, that can be hard to get into because of the cultural obstacles now, but if that can be translated, uh, then the beauty of the system reflects the beauty of um, our natural world, um, the cultural and social environment. And it's, it's all about appreciation of um, what is happening in the, in the world. Mm. Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, when you describe the sort of philosophical or ad, attitudinal underpinnings of Tantra, it definitely seems more in line with the kind of imminent uh, way that most humans orient. I mean, I, I recently saw a great video from this religious studies scholar, Don Cupid, where he said, you know, our new totalizing concept isn't God anymore, it's life. You know, at the end of someone's life when you're at their funeral, you know, no one says so-and-so uh, loved God. They say so-and-so loved life. Um, so, mm. I mean, that, that kind of fits with, with what you're describing in some ways that, um, you know, the tantric attitude is very much sort of life-embracing as opposed to sort of mm -hmm. life-transcending. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like a natural that's, fit in that sense. That, that's that's the, the essential tantric distinction. And so, uh, you know, because this is also, the, as, as he said, this is also the contemporary Western view, I think modern Buddhism, which started out in the 1800s as a very strongly renunciative system, ascetic, um, has gradually moved, without anybody noticing it, towards a tantric attitude. And it actually mainly has the attitude now but in the process of the earlier modernization, those the tools that Tantra offers um, got dropped out. And so there's now, um, I think, modern Buddhism has a, a certain weakness in having a, a rather than the sutric attitude it originated with, but it has sutric tools uh, it's retained those and hasn't adopted the tantric tools, so there's a mismatch of intention and methods. Mm, okay, I see what you're saying. So, so it's the intention may be there, but but you're saying due to the kind of methods being what being kind of um, culturally kind of obscured or uh, maybe even intentionally hidden. I don't know. I. Maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the problems uh, of, of getting this stuff out uh, and challenges. But like, I'm curious, why why is it so difficult to get to? I know we, I know you talked to, to Hokai about this a little bit, but maybe just a short mm. response because I'm I'm confused. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, there's uh, this has to do with a combination of historical accidents and um, politics. Uh, um, the, in the early phase of modernization in Asia, the the whole point of this was to make Buddhism look good to Westerners, and Tantra at that time did not look good to Westerners um, who were Christians um, uh, of a Victorian sort. Um, Tantra, you know, involves sex, and putting sex and religion together is a big problem, and uh, it's got some demons in it, and Christians don't like demons, so altogether, Tantra had to be scrubbed away. Mm. Uh, then, um, in the 1970s, some Tibetan teachers came to the West for the first time, and they started teaching Tantra, and they 
very successfully, I think, modernized it to make it relevant to the um, spiritual climate of the 1970s and 80s. I'm thinking of uh, Chögyam Trungpa, for example, Tartang Tolku, a little later Chögyal Namkai Norbu Rinpoche. Um, however, uh, that kind of got squashed partly by conservative Tibetans and partly as a result of the uh, a series of um, serious scandals um, and a general discomfort on the part of mainstream American Buddhists with this. Um, since then, there's it's it's become more and more inaccessible. I think mm -hmm. um, there's been a uh, a, a really um, I think I think it has been deliberately suppressed. Yeah, I remember you uh, in one of the articles you said it's a combination of conservative Tibetans and politically correct Westerners that kind of, in some sense, yes. uh, squished that that movement. Yes. Yeah, I guess when the so heat I, I turns up, it gets a little difficult to uh, to do things sometimes or to to accept uh, that there's something of value there. Yeah, I mean tantra is. It's uncomfortable. I mean, it's about passion, and strong emotions are um, difficult, uh, can be unpleasant, and they can be actively dangerous. Uh, you know, there there is a a reputation that tantra has for danger that's probably exaggerated, but not entirely mistaken. Mm. Okay. So, uh, David, I was wondering if we could talk a bit about uh, some of the challenges of developing a Western Tantra. I mean, you just sort of talked about the historical challenges, but I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, what some of the current challenges are um, if we were to pick this project back up. Because you you mentioned in our last conversation, you mentioned in your writing, that we're sort of entering, from your point of view, a post-consensus era, you know, a period where um, there isn't this broad consensus about what Buddhism is and what it should be. Um, you know, there's very much a splintering, and I'm sure this has a lot to do with the internet and information technologies. Um, and so, if we were to pick back up this project of reinventing Tantra, and by we, I, I don't mean me, but I just mean generally the kind of royal we, um, wh what are some of the challenges? And, 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 and one I had in mind, and maybe to start with, uh, is ritual. Because this is, in my experience, one of the biggest things that comes up when I talk to people about Buddhism in general, and, and certainly Tantra uh, in particular, I think is, is an area that people have a lot of um, kind of questions about. So um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, ritual, because you make the assertion in one of your posts on reinventing Tantra that, that a modern Tantra could be ritual free, um, but that that probably isn't a very good idea. And I wanted to see, because this is something that I've really changed my mind about in the last several years, um, what are the redeeming aspects of ritual? And, and what might modern ritual look and feel like? And how do we deal with this kind of general reactivity toward anything that looks like a ritual that, that seems to come up so often for people? Yeah. Um, well, uh, let's start with the reasons that we all hate ritual. Uh, if you say ritual, the first word that comes to mind is likely to be empty, empty ritual. Mm. Um, mostly our experience of ritual is that it's meaningless, it's boring, it's stupid, it's something that we've been forced to sit through even though we're not enjoying it, and it probably expresses values that we're not really in agreement with. Um, and often, it usually I would say, it seems like the people involved um, don't really believe in what they're doing either. Even the leaders of the ritual seem like they're just going through the motions, and um, the only purpose of this thing is somehow to reinforce some kind of institutional values of continuity and power. Um, so that is that's exactly what ritual should not be. It's a dead ritual. It's, um, it's a zombie ritual. We, we ought to put a, a bullet in the head of that. Mm. Um, what we want and, and what is possible is uh, exactly the opposite. Um, if, uh, if you think about 
uh, you know, inverting everything I just said, you get pretty directly to 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 what ritual can be, um, which is uh, emotionally exciting, not boring, intellectually fascinating, not stupid, um, intensely meaningful, not empty. Um, you know, in fact. Uh, intense meaning is what ritual is all about. It's about concentrating and directing meaning. And it inspires, uh, it produces ecstatic states of consciousness. Um, it provides purpose um, which uh, drives commitment towards action. A ritual, when it's working correctly, is all about connection. It's connecting all of the the participants in the ritual with each other. It's connecting all the participants with uh, the sacredness of the world and with all the other beings in the world. Um, in connecting the participants, it creates communities. It um, ends alienation. Uh, this is um, I talked about the atomization of of meaning, of culture, of society, of the self at the mm -hmm. beginning. Yeah. And ritual is an enormously powerful tool for overcoming that atomization uh, in each of those aspects. Um, it, uh, a, 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 a successful ritual is an experience of, of wonderment, of openness combined with passion. Um, it brings this intense, broader view, um, and, uh, you know, it, it can be and it should be a complete blast. Mm. Um, so the, unfortunately, Buddhist rituals, definitely including most tantric Buddhist rituals, are nothing like that. They are um, dead zombie rituals. And one of the major obstacles to uh, producing new Buddhist rituals that would function as excitingly powerfully as I just described is that ritual depends very heavily on symbolism. Symbolism is culturally specific. Um, because it's culturally specific ritual, specific rituals don't have a long shelf life. History, there's been constant innovation in ritual. Um, even during periods when Buddhist doctrine was very conservative, and um, you know, you, you mustn't change the word of the Buddha, leaders felt empowered to uh, develop new rituals because that's that's just a cultural expression and, and that's it's legitimate to to innovate there. Okay, that's. Um, can I stop you there? Because that, yeah. that was something that I'd never heard before. Where, where, where did you learn that? Like, how did you stumble upon that? Is that just through sort of reading the sort of Buddhist history? Is that looking back? I'm curious if people that want to kind of learn more about the history of ritual and and the sort of innovation there, like, where where, where should they look? Um, I can't recommend any sort of brief introduction, unfortunately. Um, Yes, it comes from reading the the history of, of Buddhist Tantra in Tibet and back into India. And what you find is that um, every, at most hundred years, there's major changes um, because the social situation, the cultural situation is different, um, new forms are needed. Okay. Okay. Now, now that brings up a kind of follow-up question for me because I see this definitely reflected in, in how practices are changing um, in all sorts of areas. I mean, technology might be one of the most obvious ones um, and business because there's such a strong incentive to sort of uh, keep innovating, otherwise you kind of die. Um, but, you know, it seems like we're in a situation where things aren't changing uh, drastically every hundred years, they're tra changing drastically every few years. So what does that mean for you know, creating meaningful, uh, enlivening, um, like the kind of rituals that you're describing? Like, wouldn't we also probably have to have a method for innovating on those things kind of very quickly? 
Oh, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is I feel that modern Buddhism has actually uh, been stagnant or, or static since about 1990, um, and then uh, you know it, it kind of got stuck. I think in the last five years, maybe ten years, there's been um, the beginnings of a new opening for innovation. So that's really exciting, and obviously the work you're doing uh, has has potentiated that. Um, I think uh, you know it's hard to know the the um, in terms of of developing new ritual forms or in general new presentations of tantra that reflect up to the minute cultural symbolism. Hmm. Um, there's a big question about who can do that. Mm. Uh, I don't feel I can. Um, and then, you know, who else wants to and can, I don't know. Uh, I, I sort of feel like it ideally should be and perhaps could be a group effort. Um, I think innovation, innovators need peers. Uh, when I, you know, was a scientist and engineer, having a peer group to bounce ideas off of uh, who can tell you when you've got it wrong and suggest ideas collaborate, that's hugely important. And I, I I think there's um, the lack of peer communication and support for Buddhist teachers and leaders is something that's a structural problem in uh, contemporary Western Buddhism. I'd love to see that addressed. Mm, okay. Okay. Interesting. So it sounds like in some sense, you, you would see this as a kind of uh, co-participatory or co-designed effort, like that a group of peers um, could come together and sort of uh, basically come up with different ideas for, for how we might employ ritual. And then, you know, I, I guess another um, maybe difference, I'm, I, I assume, would be the role that, that people who are participating in those rituals, even if they're not designing them directly, would play in that process because that's one of the things that seems really clearly to have changed um, across the board is the the role in which um, those that are participating in the things created for them um, th there's much less of a line between the designers and the people who are using things. User center designed. Right, yeah. right. I mean, everyone's the marketer now, you know, for everything um, on Facebook, you know, and 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 there's some aspect of that which is also quite bizarre because it seems to, in some sense, be uh, a continuation of some sort of uh, um, power trip, you know, to, 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 con to continue being able to maintain some sort of central authority over things. But on the other hand, it also seems to really blur the lines of that authority. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of throw that um, thought fragment at you and, and see if, if you have any response. Yes, uh, absolutely. I think... Um a successful ritual now has to be um, radically participatory mm. and uh, you know in Tibet I don't know what the situation is so much in other countries that had Buddhist Tantra in Tibet basically you know those Lama sitting up at the front who waved things around and chanted mumbo jumbo and everybody else kind of sat there watching and that was kind of the extent of it and that's also the you know, traditional Christian model, and that's not workable um, now. Mm. That's like the sage on the it, stage model. <laughs> I hadn't heard that term. Yes, that's right. Um, my background in ritual comes mainly from before I was a Buddhist. Um, I was uh, a, a neo-pagan, and there's um, a lot of um, experience and, I, you know, technology, you might say, for ritual design there mm. that um, I think could be drawn on in um, th thinking about how new Buddhist rituals could be constructed. And th those rituals are very much participatory. Uh, for the most part, could could you give um, an example of what a participatory ritual um, 
looks like? Because that's something I have, I'm not super familiar with. Yeah, well, uh, you know, ritual in, in general brings together typically a lot of different art forms, um, which can include, uh, for example, singing, dancing, costume, um, and so in a participatory ritual, uh, you, uh, those, everybody involved may sing, everybody involved may dance, um, everybody involved may wear uh, a, a suitable symbolic outfit, which they may have constructed themselves, so there's uh, an element of at least assembling or actually stitching your own clothes to participate. Um, and those, um, you know, the experience of, of singing in a group that's very simple, but it can be very powerful. There's a, a real energetic quality to that. And I think people, uh, you know, the idea is not very off-putting for many people because they feel they can't sing, and I certainly, my voice is not great, I can't sing, but um, if you have a, a simple tune with words that are you can learn in a couple of minutes, most people find that they're willing to join in quietly at first, and then they get over their inhibitions and they sing along, and everything's loud enough that you don't feel like your voice is offending anyone. And uh, you know the combination of really loud music is important. Really loud music. Um, I think you know we have technology for really loud music in the West, which uh, surpasses anything that was available in Asia. I would like to see. Uh, you know, they did their best um, with really big drums and you know the Tibetan longhorns, which are about ten feet long and they really are loud. Um, but electric music, electronic bass, uh, that, that could be great. Okay, so, uh, we, so could, we could take it to another level, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think Western, um, Western artistic culture has big resources that could be brought to bear on Buddhist ritual if we didn't have the idea that you're supposed to do it the way that people did it in Asia. Yeah, which is such a powerful idea, and, and that was one of the other kind of points I wanted to address with you. Um, and I also want to just encourage folks, you know, who are tuning in now, if you have questions, you know, feel free to start throwing in them them into the Q and A app. We'll, we'll we'll definitely respond to a few of them. Um, but sort of my last question has to do with um, lineage, because even as I was speaking with a close friend. Uh, yesterday about the conversation we're going to have, and, and definitely uh, Rinzen, your partner, mentioned this as well as a good question to explore. Um, there is this sense from people, I guess maybe folks who are familiar with the tantric traditions or familiar with the Vajrayana um, approach, that um, basically says, you know, transmission of lineage is extremely important and there are certain things that you get from someone in a kind of direct experiential way that gets kind of like, uh, you know, it sort of supercharges your experience or your understanding or helps you kind of learn what's going on quicker and that somehow it's really important that that be, uh, that that be intact. Um, and so I wondered, you know, mm -hmm. in this case, you know, if, if Tantra is being actively suppressed as you claim, you know, how in the hell um, can we deal with the issue of, of lineage and that being sort of an intact thing? Yeah, uh, there's a lot of strands we could explore there. That's a, a big question. Sure. Um, one distinction is uh, through lineage. There's institutional lineage, which is sort of the official authorization by some group that you're okay. Um, I'm simply not interested in that. Um, I think it's best ignored. Um, the second issue is personal transmission, um, which I think is absolutely enormously important. Um, 
uh, this gets at the awkward issue of the role of the teacher in Tantra, which is uncomfortable um, for lots of reasons. And that central issue, well, that was the central issue for Westerner, uh, Western suppression of Buddhist Tantra in um, America, Europe, I think. Um, but uh, I, I think there's a possibility for the um, there's a correlation here of on one hand the view that the the traditional Asian model is sacrosanct and absolutely nothing in that can change for the teacher the guru disciple relationship and I I don't really think that's right. There's also you know some of increasingly radical views in the West reaching out to people who say uh, we shouldn't have Buddhist teachers at all. Um, you know, uh, we can learn from books, we can learn from our peers. Any sort of Buddhist teacher is a danger, and we shouldn't have them. Yeah. So I think that there's a lot of room for middle ground. Um, I think that much more um, there's there's a much more important role for teachers in other than other forms of Buddhism. And the the traditional explanations of that sound magic, and I don't think it's magic. Mm. Um, uh, and then just to, to contradict what I just said, I think that there's a, a final sense of lineage, which is um, visionary lineage, uh, that you find in practice that um, it's hard to say this without sounding woo, uh, but um, you have the support of the great heroes of the past. You have the support of uh, the deities, and the deities don't exist, but their support is hugely important. I'm not sure that any of those things answered your question. Uh, no, they they do they do in the sense of framing lineage in multiple dimensions and. Um, could you say it just a tad more about the deities support which don't exist? Uh, yeah. Well, there's the don't exist, and then there's the support. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have a essentially naturalistic scientific worldview, uh, so um, I don't believe in gods. Uh, the the so-called deities are not exactly gods. Um, I think their you know precise ontological status of you know how they do and don't exist is a, a subtle, open, interesting question for philosophers. But it's not really relevant. Um, I think the the way to approach them as a practitioner is that um, you work with them as visualized entities and they take on some sort of life of their own and uh, you know that's something you just accept and you work with it and um, there's a there can be a huge power in that mm, okay is is this anything akin to the notion of archetypes or um, kind of universal symbology or, or some, something along those lines I'm not trying to Kind of fit what you're saying into into another schema, but just wondering if there's any relationship there. Um, yeah, that idea goes back to Carl Jung's own introduction to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, where he drew an analogy between hmm. uh, the tantric deities and archetypes. Um, I think it's it's valuable in that it understands them as not being external, solidly existing entities. Um, I think it's misleading in that the archetypes are uh, supposedly universal across all people and all cultures. And the the Yidams, the so-called deities, the deity is a bad translation. Most of them actually aren't deities. A lot of them are historical people who you know, we're flesh and blood, they lived and died, they've got biographies, we know quite a lot about, you know, where they lived and what they did. 
Uh, so those are definitely not gods. Um, and the so th so they're extremely specific. There's nothing archetypical about them. Um, they're they're heroes, but they're not archetypal heroes. And and the the ten the ones that are gods are very strange in a lot of cases, and you know not definitely anything you get in any other culture. Okay, interesting, cool. No, thanks for uh, for going into that, and um, and thank you too for yeah exploring some of the sort of challenges. Are there are there any other main challenges you see that you want to just kind of touch on? I, I know we don't have time to go into all of them, but um, maybe we can follow up in a few years and see uh, see how things are going. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the um, the major question is one of uh, whether there's receptivity to this kind of idea, how it would fit into contemporary uh, society and culture in a way that uh, is acceptable and understandable. And I, I think there's real open questions there that are, are very unclear. Mm. Okay. So... Um... I think that's a fine place to leave it because I think you're right. I mean, at least listening to you, um, it seems like there are some things that are quite unclear. And yet it also sounds like there is a kind of opening of possibility in what yes. you're describing. And that, to me, is exciting. Great. It, it's certainly exciting to me. I, I do think that um, there are real possibilities here. Yeah, and you know, j just a final kind of reflection, and this is something you know we 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 spoke about a bit privately. Um, you know, I think there there is this constant tension, at least in my experience, of having this conversation of what a relevant, alive Buddhist or many Buddhist forms might look like. You know, today, um, in the sense that. I think the people asking those questions obviously care deeply about what they've learned from their own experience, and at the same time, there's this feeling I think you know, that both of us could relate to of really feeling like there's a certain inadequacy to the forms we've learned, and really wanting to to like feel the the deep relevant potential of it made real. And yet, there's also I think this further complication, which is um, who am I to try to like do that? I mean, I just barely scratched the surface of this stuff. You know, the, the further I go, the more I realize how deep, you know, how deep the pool is. So I think there is this kind of, I don't know if you call it an innovator's dilemma of some sort, but there is this, I think, very challenging place to sit in where, you know, knowing that to innovate also means to really mess things up and to really, like, get things wrong and maybe even to hurt or harm people. Um, and and yes. I certainly see that playing out in this you know, in this kind of exploration, you know, because there's on the one hand this recognition of the potential and on the other hand this sort of hesitancy to step into that, um, you know, and, and I certainly feel the same way and I, um, you know, for what it's worth I think there are a lot of people exploring on these fringes and, you know, I think there is a lot of uh, solace in the, that recognition, you know, the, the recognition that there are other folks doing this and that there are people interested in this stuff. I think that uh, really hits the nail on the head for me personal hesitations about taking this further. Um, there's uh, just real um, sense of, whoa, uh, you know, I, I don't feel up to the task, and yet it's something that's really important, and so somebody may have to do it, and uh, I, maybe that's where I think the peer group is is really important. Yes, and and you know, like you said in our in your last conversation with Hokai, I think there is a distinction between coming together and, and forming a kind of broad consensus, and coming together and sort of hashing things out and and you know, um, talking about things and really putting things to you know to the test and experimenting and leaving room open for disagreement and you know even. Um, complete uh, and utter, you know, <laughs> uh, dismissal of each other's <laughs> ideas. 
Yeah, and I think you know you've been Buddhist Geeks organization, and you personally have seen that in a way that has been very helpful for uh, contemporary Buddhism. Cool, thank you. I appreciate that, and I appreciate your um, explorations on this topic. And I hope it leads to some good stuff. You know, I hope I hope people that are listening to this um, find it of interest, and maybe there's some hardcore tantric practitioners out there that are doing the same thing that might, you know, um, kind of reach out and, and connect. Um, so thank you. That would be great. Yeah, it's great to have you on the on the program again. And uh, uh, maybe, maybe we could turn to some just a couple quick questions. David's uh, uh, been kind enough to to stick around for a few more minutes, um, and said he could sort of answer questions until his vo voice went went. So <laughs> maybe we'll uh, <laughs> test you on that. Um, so yeah, so there's a couple questions already, and 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 if you have others, you know, feel free to um, to put them into the Q and A app. Um, I'll start with Alex. Uh, Alex Loden. Um, David, what are your views on neo tantra and the sex positive movement? Um, I am much more disposed toward that than I think um, most Buddhist uh, tantra practitioners are. Uh, I think that um, it can be uh, silly and new age and uh, reductive in some ways, and yada 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 yada. But um, you know, there's also um, some potential there for uh, well, a lot of potential for um, improving our experience of each other, the way we relate to each other. Uh, so I, I'm I think it's great, basically. I, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. It, um, I, I guess the other thing I should say is that it, it it's historically connected with Buddhist Tantra uh, in the very distant past, and there are, are some things in common, and it has some of the same worldview in terms of seeing the entire world as sacred and seeing... Uh, our own bodies as sacred, seeing humans as uh, other people as, as sacred, um, that sex and romance are uh, good things and that they're spiritual activities. Um, that said, nearly everything else is different. The worldview mainly comes of, of Western Neo Tantra comes from Hindu Tantra, um, and it's philosophical underpinnings and its goals are quite different from those of Buddhist Tantra. So there's um, there's a, a big disjunction there. All right. Thank you, Alex, for the question. And uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, to learn more about Neo-Tantra. Um, so another good question here from Aran uh, Globin. Um, Aran, sorry Hi, Aran. if I... Yeah. Sorry, if, Aran, I, I totally messed up your last name there. Um, be, beyond the writing and research you're doing and beyond this conversation, uh, what would be a good next step in this process? Uh, for somebody interested in practicing in this way, um, unfortunately, what I'm describing is basically all a fantasy. Um, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, there are some t teachers teaching Buddhist Tantra in semi-modern ways or ways that are more adapted to Western culture. Um, uh, my own teachers um, are one place to go, my own lineage, the Aroter. Uh, it's not as radically modern as what I've sketched at all, but um, it's, I love it. It's where I learned everything. Um, uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche uh, has a system called Three Doors, which I don't know very much about, but is um, very much uh, in line with this general approach. Um, I, uh, for one-on-one -on -one teaching, I would uh, send anybody interested to uh, Hokai Sobol, our friend, who um, uh, is uh, has very much the same perspective that I do. Okay, cool. So it sounds like there's some people and some groups that are kind of 
uh, approaching something like what you're sketching out, but not completely. And it and it doesn't sound like, in some sense, there is an answer to that to the question to the to to Aran's question. What's the next step? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, basically you have to go with what exists now, and um, that means dealing with. Uh, a fair amount of cultural Asian tradition that you may not like. Um, I, I, you know, I, I actually love a lot of it, and um, I'm willing to set aside my uh, qualms about other aspects of it. Um, but most people won't, may not be willing to do that. But if if you want this badly enough, that's that's where you go. Mm. Okay. Um, a somewhat unsatisfactory answer, but I uh, hopefully <laughs> see some. Uh... I, you know, I, I would love to say, hey, we've got this thing. You know, you can sign up today. Here's what you do first: you start with this practice, and then you know you uh, go on to the next practice. And you know, here's what what happens if you do that one wrong. And here's you know, here's the practice manual. I, I think um, you know the pragmatic Dharma movement has done a great job of that for. Um, for Vipassana, mm. uh, nothing like that exists for Tantra. I think it probably actually can't exist in quite that way because there is, um, Tantra is inherently relational and so there's always going to have to be forming a relationship with a teacher is is going to be part of the path. Yes. Um, it's, it's, you know, no, no way of avoiding that. Yeah, I mean, and and there are limitations with the uh, the cookbook style approach. Um, you know, from my own experience, ha having helped um, develop the whole pragmatic dharma thing. So, um, you know, even there, I think it's true that everything is relationship. <laughs> so mm. there's no way around having to learn some shit from from and with other people. Yeah, and it, it uh, the, I think the essence is an attitude, and the only way you you can't really describe the attitude I tried, but you can't really describe the attitude in words very well. It's something that you pick up by seeing it in action. Right, right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's so clearly one of the ways in which teaching happens is through um, the expression of someone's understanding through you know, just mundane things it could be. I mean, I remember yeah. spending time in Los Angeles uh, where we were there hanging out with a teacher of ours and um, she, you know, taught me a hell of a lot more through how she was than what she said. And Absolutely. That's that was, the essence of it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think you're right on about that. Um, at, at the same time, you know, something like uh, a kind of modern primer to Tantra, I mean, it, it can be a very good tool, I, I imagine, for introducing people to some of the basic practices and concepts and maybe as a doorway into something like that. Yes, uh, I guess I I could recommend one book, which is by my teacher Nakpa Chögyam, um, which is called Wearing the Body of Visions. That's probably the closest thing there is to an introductory practice manual. Um, but he would say, and I would say that you're not going to learn to do this on your own from reading that book. It's a really inspiring book. It does give a lot of information. Um, but you're you're not going to learn the practice that way. You really do have to go to a teacher um, and have the one-on-one. -on -one. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, great. Um, cool. So another question from uh, Ryan Johnson. Uh, Ryan says you write about the renunciate versus engage, sutric versus tantric attitudes, and that combining the two attitudes doesn't really make sense. Uh, why do you feel that it is nonsensical to have, say, an 85% tantric engagement and 15% 50, renunciative life practice? Um, I think you absolutely can do that if you aren't trying to do the two things at the same time. Um, I do practice renunciation at times uh, when situation is one that you can't deal with in a tantric way because it's too intense, um, that's the time to back off into renunciation. Uh, the, 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 what, what I, I should qualify this by saying that 
many, many systems do combine um, renunciation and tantra. I personally don't understand how that works, and I'm skeptical that it can work, but uh, that's actually the most common approach in, in the modern era. Um, well, modern meaning the last 700 years, maybe. Um, I find that these things point in opposite directions. Tantra points towards engagement. Um, Sutra points towards uh, retracting from the world, from cutting connections rather than creating them. You just can't do both of those at the same time. Okay, cool. Um, okay, maybe, maybe the final question, unless someone else decides to challenge your voice. Um, so, uh, uh, Stefan Iverson, um, do you know the non-Buddhist tantric teacher Daniel Odier, O-D-I-E-R, and would you recommend him as an introduction to tantra? Um, I've read a couple of his books, and I liked a lot of things about them. Um, they were ones he wrote probably ten or more years ago. I don't know anything about him as a teacher. Um, he is teaching Hindu Tantra, um, which is uh, has some of the same things and is very different in other ways. Uh, so I, I actually can't say... Uh, anything more about him, so I'm, I'm ignorant um, other than that I liked a couple of his books. Mm. Okay, great. So, potentially interesting stuff there. Um, great, it looks like um, looks like that's all the questions we have at the moment, so um, let's let's wrap up here. Great, thank you very much, this has been really interesting. Yeah, for, for me as well, and uh, hopefully for everyone tuning in, um, you've enjoyed kind of this interesting, um, I guess, journey through what Tantra is, what it might look like in the modern world, and, and, and how we might but probably won't reinvent it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just being a little. I'm being a little. I'm being a little facetious there. Um, well, I actually I, have you know, great I, hope. I, I, I have hope, uh, which, according to Tantra, one shouldn't have hope. <laughs> <laughs> one should have no hope and no fear. You just do your best. Okay, great. So we do our best, and maybe something will happen, and maybe it won't. Okay, awesome. Thank you, David. Great, great having you on. Thank you. All right, bye.